It's good to see you for Advent Sunday number four. Um, you know, it's my practice when I study the scriptures and even when I'm just reading them uh, to actually come to the text with the expectation of surprise. Um, I always ask the question when I'm reading a text from scripture, preparing it, I ask myself, what stands out to me? What surprises me? Um, Now, if you've been a Christian for a long time, one of the unintended consequences of what otherwise is a good thing, which is the continual exposure to scripture and reading and and messages over the years, one of the unintended consequences is that we sometimes seek, we cease to be surprised uh, by scripture, by what we read or hear. That's normal, but it's unfortunate. Because, you know, surprise actually has its benefits when it comes to learning. First, by the way, I'm told by uh, uh, neuroscientists that surprise activates the release of dopamine into our bodies. That's kind of the reward system, the reward chemical, which if it's a pleasant surprise, it causes us to kind of focus on something and explore something further. And the second good thing about surprise is it usually brings us to look at things in new ways. Um, And that's especially important for things that are rich and deep and mysterious. Because there are so many things to look at. See, mystery is not something that's opaque, something that can't be known. Mystery is something that is so rich that we need to keep exploring its vastness and its depth and its richness. So surprise draws us into that richness. So I always kind of come to the scriptural text saying, what is surprising? And and I'm pretty used to that because, you know, uh, every time we open scripture, it is a cross-cultural experience, right? These are folks that uh, lived at least 2,000 years ago, and often more. Um, And if you've ever been involved in cross-cultural experiences, there are plenty of surprises each day that you're in another country, or or even in this country, in another culture. Um, and indeed, that's kind of the experience opening scripture. So I always open and go, what is surprising here? What stands out to me? Um, and that's especially important this time of year, Advent, Christmas, right? When these passages are becoming very familiar, if you've been around any length of time. But still, I was surprised this week as I was preparing the Matthew 1 passage, the announcement to Joseph this time in Matthew. Remember, in, in Luke, we get the announcement to Mary, but the announcement to Joseph that his fiance is going to have a son, and that son's going to be named Jesus. Um, but here's what surprised me. Actually, what surprised me was probably the thing that should have surprised me least. And it comes in verse 21, and simply the line, She will bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. Well, of course. Of course. I was surprised, though, by something that actually was surprising because it was so familiar, if that makes sense. And even if you've been a Christian for a little while, this is the one thing we know, right? Jesus came into this world to save us or forgive us of our sins. His very name, Yeshua, in Hebrew means salvation. So why did that surprise me? Well, again, I wondered, is it really as familiar to me as it was to them, or them to me? Um, Did they really look forward to this forgiveness in the same way I do? Um, I mean, what would a a 20-something Joseph or a teenage Mary, when they heard that Yeshua was going to be born and, and would save them from their sins, what were they thinking? Were they thinking what I think, which is, yes, Lord, I I need to be saved from my sins. And unfortunately, the older you get, the more they come into view, right? Um, Unfortunately. So I wonder if their experience of forgiveness was like mine. Because I, too, um, rejoice that the Savior has come to forgive us of our sins. So before I unpack that, uh, what it might mean to a first century Jew... I want you to actually think for a minute with me. I want you to think of a time when you did or said something which you regretted. Maybe something that hurt another person. 
And what did you feel when the reality of it hit you? That there might be significant consequences for this in your relationship with that person. What if this person was a really significant part of your world? A family member? A business partner? A best friend? And your actions or words fractured something to the point where you wondered if it could be repaired. Has that happened to you? Or if it hasn't, can you imagine it? Can you imagine how your whole world might look different now? How the places in which you knew this person seemed a little more empty as you passed them by. Or perhaps if you felt an impulse to call them almost a muscle memory from all, the, all that time of communicating with them, now you wondered, can I still call them? Or even as you tried to imagine your future without that person, it may actually just have changed your whole view of yourself. I don't know if you can imagine that. In such cases, you might feel guilt or shame like we do when we've hurt someone. And you might long for forgiveness from that person. But you wouldn't probably long for it just to take away the feelings of shame and guilt. No, you'd long for that forgiveness for the sake of restoration. Not to simply uh, no longer feel the guilt, but to actually want what was there before to be restored. Because you can't imagine your life, even your identity, without them. Well, if you can imagine that, then you're getting a little closer to how the people of God would have received this news that the Messiah had come to forgive them. So to get a little closer to this, I want to actually do a very quick motorcycle ride through their history. The story of the Israelites through the scriptures is the story of a lot of going away and a lot of coming back. And a lot of going away again and a lot of coming back again. There's a lot of building up and there's a lot of tearing down. There's slavery and there's exodus. There's exile and there's restoration. And certainly it would take too long to move through the whole story because it happens repeatedly. Time and time again. But you'll recognize some of the moments. And a good place to start is actually... In Genesis 12, with God's call and covenant to Abraham, whose name is uh, then Abram, but lengthened to Abraham. And the promises to Abraham are spectacular, right? In 12 verses 2 and 3, God says to Abraham, I will make you a great nation, and I will bless you, and I will make your name great, so that you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you and curse those who curse you, and through you all the families of the earth will be blessed. That's an important phrase. The promise is that all the families of the earth, all the nations, will be blessed through you. That's your calling. Well, of course, even as we get to Genesis 12, there's a lot of water under the bridge, a lot of going out and coming back, right? There's Adam and Eve exiled from the garden. There's Cain's murder of Abel. And then there's a generation that is so off track that they need a watery reboot entirely. And just before this chapter, in chapter 11 of Genesis, after much more lostness, the people try to control their own destiny by building a tower to heaven in their own image, an advanced kind of parody of the temple where Jesus and God should dwell. And God, in his commitment to them, tears it down. So they might experience a saving confusion about who they are and what their callings are. Later, of course, in the story, Jacob, Abraham's grandson, would have a son, Joseph, whose half-brothers will sell him into slavery, into exile in Egypt. Out they go again. But then Joseph becomes God's agent of rescue for his family during a famine. Seventy of them coming to Egypt. Exile becomes restoration. But over time, the Hebrew people in Egypt become so powerful that Pharaoh fears them, so they go back into slavery. Then Moses becomes their rescuer. And God promises to take them into a new land, which they will eventually reach, not without much disobedience and complaining. And so we have deliverance from slavery. And their life in the land, well, that'll be up and down. Having been given kings by their own request, those kings were both good and bad, though mostly bad. 
having forgotten the covenant God made with Abraham that they were to be a light to the nations, they instead fell in with them into idolatry, into injustice, time and time again, deaf to the prophets, and then taken away again into exile, into Babylon. And even this exile, though, or these exiles, does not represent God giving up on them, giving up on the call to be a light to the nations. No, he even says through the prophet Jeremiah to them in exile, to all the exiles whom I have sent into exile from Jerusalem to Babylon, do this. Build houses and live in them. Plant gardens and eat their produce. Take wives and have sons and daughters. Take wives for your sons and give your daughters in marriage that they may bear sons and daughters. Multiply there and do not decrease. But seek the welfare of the city. Do you hear that refrain from the covenant with Abraham? Seek the welfare of the city. Be a light to the nation. Seek the welfare of the city where I have sent you into exile and pray to the Lord on its behalf for in its welfare you too will find welfare. You see, Israel's calling wherever they were was the same. To be image bearers. To represent God to the nations. Still, that's not the story the Israelites latched on to. Based on some other prophecies, they focused narrowly on the promise that God would vindicate them and overthrow their enemies. God would return to a rebuilt temple where heaven and earth would be united. And this was going to be done through a Messiah. So this history, I sketched out briefly, is all to say that for regular Jews like Joseph and Mary and others, the news that Jesus would save them from their sins was the same as saying, the exile is over. To say your sins are forgiven is to say the exile is finally over. That God would vindicate them, return them to their land, overthrow its rulers, and reign in a rebuilt temple. Well, they were allowed to return to their land after Babylon went under new ownership of the Persians. But you know, that didn't solve anything really. Because the feeling of exile followed them home as they were subjects to a series of foreign powers all the way down to the time of Jesus and the Romans. You know, the promise that the Messiah would restore them by forgiving them of their sins would be carried out it turns out, in a very surprising way. But one that derived directly from that first promise. Yes, he would forgive them their sins. He would bring them out of exile. But it was so that they could really be his people, really be the image of God, really be a blessing to all the nations, rather than defining themselves in opposition to all the nations. See, what Jesus knew is that the enslaving power of exile was not at its root a battle with foreign powers. It was the refusal of the Israelites' vocation to live and bear the image of God and be a light to the nations wherever they were. Jeremiah prophesies this, which underlines God's commitment to this vocation in the Israelites. He says, this is the covenant I will make with the house of Israel after those days, declares the Lord. I will put my law within them. I will write it on their hearts. I will be their God and they shall be my people. And no longer shall each one teach his neighbor and each his brother saying, know the Lord, for they will all know me. From the least of them to the greatest, declares the Lord. This is the good news that Jesus brought. That the Spirit would be poured out into his people so that they could more and more reflect his image that they more and more would be restored and so could be a blessing to others what might this mean for us what might it mean to consider forgiveness of sins as not just kind of a a moving through and unloading only shame and guilt though there is that what would it mean if it to confess our sins is, is not only a reminder that that we have been saved and are going to heaven on earth, as it turns out. But what would it mean to come and confess our sins, realizing that this is a vehicle for God to restore us, to restore us to our calling each week, to restore us to the kingdom of God? I had to chuckle to myself last night. I was walking through Fashion Island, and uh, they're building a uh, flagship for restoration hardware. Four stories, uh, flagship uh, retail. Uh, building. 
And I thought to myself, restoration hardware, that's what we're about. They should give us a floor. <laughs> no, this is restoration hardware here and software. For us, our weekly practice of confession is a reminder that, yeah, we are prone to wander. We are prone to fall in with the other nations, like sheep, to fall in with the present kingdoms as they fall apart. In one of our prayers of confession in the Book of Common Prayer, we read this, Almighty and most merciful Father, we have erred and strayed from your ways like lost sheep. We'll say this today. We have followed too much the devices and desires of our own hearts. We are sheep mindful that we need sometimes to be led back. That it's easy to wander in and among the ways of the present kingdoms. Confession, to use an older term for spiritual disciplines, is a means of grace. A means of grace. And as a means of grace, our practice of confession each week helps to restore us each week. And I want to talk about four ways it does that as we close. First, you know, what it, you know what it does to come each week and to confess our sins, to kneel before the Lord, is that it brings self-knowledge. Another one of the prayers of confession in the Book of Common Prayer says this, Most merciful God, we confess that we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed by what we have done and by what we have left undone. Thought, word, and deed. When I take our students through this at, at, at the college, um, we do confession every week in a certain service that I lead. Um, and I say, let's do that. Let's take a moment. Thought, word, and deed. Where have your thoughts been this week? We spend some time kind of just before God, kind of letting the Holy Spirit put his finger um, on any place that our thoughts have gone that felt like we were kind of moving into exile a little bit. How about, how about our words, I say? What, what, what words have you spoken this week? Maybe, maybe just a, a joke that was a little too sarcastic, a little too biting. Uh, maybe it was a lie that was, well, yeah, it was only a white lie, but still it was usually done in an effort to defend ourselves <laughs> and our deeds and our, and our things left undone. Now, that's a huge category, right? Things left undone. I mean, dang it. But... Usually that's not just like the hundred things we could do as Christians. Usually that's something that God has been actually inviting us over some period of time to attend to. A relationship that needs mending. Um, someone we need to call. And so as we kneel in confession, we think, yeah, Lord, is there anything that I've resisted? That's the category of things left undone. But each week, you know, we get to actually kind of grow in self-knowledge. And you know what self-knowledge does? It produces humility. At least before the cross, it produces humility. Because, you know, for us, and you'll read this in the margin of your liturgy next to the prayer of confession, there is no condemnation. Now, there may be sorrow. Sorrow is appropriate. But there's no condemnation. You know what all this is? It's good information. So good. Lord, show me myself. If there's any, any people that should be able to live in the truth of themselves as Christians. Because we don't have to defend ourselves. We have a defense. Much of the chaos in our culture, in our lives, is people seeking in so many ways to defend themselves from their shame and their guilt. Through pride, through deception. Oh, but Christians, we no longer seek a defense. See, only the cross can really deal with our shame and guilt. And so we can open, we should be able to open to the truth of ourselves unlike any other people. Because there's no condemnation, though there may be sorrow. So self-knowledge brings humility. And, but you know what else is deepened in us through confession? Is the love of God. Because if, there's, if we say, I, I, I'll make no defense, Lord. I will rely only on the cross. Well, then each week we get to experience God's forgiveness. You know, God's forgiveness, by the way, does exist. It's like a thing in the universe out there for us, right? It's always there whether we know our sins or not. Uh, you might call it kind of metaphysical forgiveness. It just exists. God forgives our sins past, present, and future. They're forgiven. But this, this knowledge shouldn't be like on a book on a shelf. What confession each week does allows us to take that book down and open it up. And what we might call existential forgiveness allows us to experience once again, oh my gosh, I'm forgiven. Once again. 
The gospel was not just a conversion doctrine, it's a sanctification doctrine. I get to revisit it every week. I get to like carve a deeper space. God carves a deeper space in me to receive the love of God. I tell my students, because we do prayer of confession every week, I say, some of you are getting tired of this. Because you're, 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 um, you know, you're having to rehearse the same old sins before the Lord because our lives don't change that fast. Ah, but here's what you get to do. You get to say, oh my gosh, Lord, again this time, you forgive me. And the gospel is deepened. You know, it's been said, and I think this might be right, that spiritual formation at its very root is simply the deepening and deepening of the gospel. With confession, every week, we get to receive again the truth that there is no condemnation in Christ Jesus. Though there may be sorrow. And there is love. Because you see, you know how that restores us? Because of the words of my friend Todd Hall at Rosemary School of Psychology, we need to be loved into loving. It turns out that how we love others is to receive love to greater and greater capacity. When Paul prays in Ephesians 3, that I pray you would have the strength through his spirit in your inner being to know the height and breadth and length and depth of the love of Christ. He's not talking about like brute strength. Some people, often people tell me about another person, they'll say, that person's a strong Christian. I'll say, how much can he bench? No, it's not that kind of strength. No, the, the strength they're talking about when he says, I pray that you would have the strength to grasp the height and width and length and breadth of the love of Jesus is more like oxygen. It's more like capacity. So if I haven't been working out for a while and I go running, I will go like this. I don't have the capacity to take in oxygen. But if I continue, my lungs expand and I can take in oxygen. So it is with the gospel. We, in a sense, are engaged in these rhythms and practices at HTC, including confession, in which we develop more capacity, lung capacity, if you will, for love. And you know what love does? It frees us from ourselves. It frees us from having to defend ourselves, having to put ourselves first. It allows us to sacrifice. Love frees us, and that is what the obstacle is to loving others, our lack of freedom. Our bent inness on ourself. Ah, but each week we get to be reminded as we are forgiven before the Lord, past, present, and future, of the relevance of the gospel each week. And this loves us over time into loving. So, yeah, Jesus came to save us, to forgive us our sins, but not simply to go to heaven. Not simply to get rid of shame and guilt, but to come out of exile, to be restored, to live into our identity. This is who we are, people of the kingdom of God. And in the words of one prayer of confession, what the return to this practice does, it gives us a vision of the goodness of the kingdom. That we may delight in your will, Lord, and walk in your ways. To the glory of your holy name. Amen. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit.